Okay, so I'll start now. Um, and we can let people join in. So hi everyone, my name is Momo Arai. I'm a fourth year medical student. And today I'll be talking about the pituitary gland. It's like one of the first anatomy lectures you guys will have um, in endorepro. Um, and basically it's like in endocrine system, you will be taking a lot about each gland on its own. So this by itself is only about the pituitary gland. Um, there are some histology slides, physiology, sli uh, physiology and um, embryology slides. Uh, and I know that like it, it was kind of a mess when I opened the slides, so I fixed them into sections and we'll talk about them, even though I use the same slides as uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, but let's get into it. And if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me in between or either by chat or you can unmute. OK. Um, OK. So let's. So first, I'll, I'd like to talk about anatomy, what this the gland is, and where it's located, so you guys have an idea of, um, like if in anatomy station, let's say if they ask you. So pituitary gland, another name for it is something called hypophysis. So hypo, I'd like to think like it's below a structure. We'll see what that is later. So, um, pituitary gland. Remember hypothesis. So if they say in a question, let's say, uh, just know that they're talking about pituitary gland. Um, again, so the important thing about it is its location. I'll try to go on the next slide, which has the structures, uh, on it, and I'll try to see show you where it is. So the first thing, uh. Apart from the pituitary gland, there are a few ways where you can how you can tell where it is. The first thing that I like to do is look at the stalk, something called the stalk. So the stalk is something connecting the pituitary gland to something above it. Remember what I said before about something being above the pituitary gland. So from this image, you can see that the stalk is this thing here, right? It looks like a stalk. It's like a line connecting them. So this one, um, the label will come, but yeah. Maybe I'll show you. So this one here. Um, again, infundibulum is kind of like this, the name for the stock they give. And it's this structure here. The arrow is kind of, OK, sorry, not this one, this one, the small, the small one. So this one is it's another structure, but this one even looks like a line. So this is the stock um, infundibulum. Now, what's above it and what's below it is what you should know. So above the stock is something we call hypothalamus. This by its like by the name itself, it says below thalamus. So you by that you know that above it is something called the thalamus, which you will take in neuro, like not not now. So it's okay, don't worry about it. So thalamus and then something called hypothalamus, below thalamus. Mm -hmm. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland in our like, uh, which is the focus of this lecture, and this is the pituitary gland. So it it looks like a gland. So look for a line like the stalk with a gland attached to it, that's your pituitary gland. So you will see here, again, the, what's the other name for pituitary gland? It's hypothesis, okay? Hypothesis. Now, um, again, this pituitary gland, where is it located? We said it's connected to the hypothalamus uh, by a stalk or infundibulum, that's up. What, where is it contained in? Where is it like located? It's in this, it's a, in a depression. Like you see the bone here, it makes a space for the pituitary gland. That is something called cella tertica here. So we'll go back to the slide. It says it's a depression of the sphenoid bone called the cella tertica. So this space or depression is called cella tertica. The space, the bone where the space is in, this bone here is called sphenoid bone. So the hole in the sphenoid bone, basically, um, from the name uh, oid and I guess hole, uh, the pituitary gland is there. Okay, it's like sitting there. There's a nice space for it. Now, this one here, so that's the sphenoid, that's ho the whole sphenoid bone. And then the last one, oh, okay, so this was how it was in the lecture, but I would name this arrow um, cella tertica because that's the depression caused by the sphenoid bone. So if we go back, we mentioned all of these points. Um, the hypothesis is a it's an endocrine gland located at the base of the skull. Yeah, that's right, it's here at the base of the skull. This is the base um, in a depression of the sphenoid bone called cella tertica. This depression is called cella tertica, connected by infundibulum to the structure about, above it, which is called hypothalamus. Now, the hypothesis or pituitary gland has two main structures you can see here. There is a line here, right? So this part in front of it is anterior because that's your nose, so it's in front. This one here is posterior because it's towards the back of your head, 
Okay, so anterior pituitary gland, posterior pituitary gland. Another name for both of them are, uh, and for anterior, AA, adeno uh, hypothesis, again from this name. And then for posterior, it's something called neuro hypothesis. So let's try to break it down. For the first one, adeno means gland in general. Okay. So it has glandular structures once we go to histology. So adeno gland, AA, anterior, that's the first one. Second one, P and um, I guess N. So posterior, by from the name neuro, it means it has neural structures or nerves in the posterior part. Just remember this for the coming upcoming slides. So here, posterior is neuro. So it means it has some nerves coming from where? Coming from up, which is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus has, from here, it has nerves that go to the posterior side only, not the anterior one. The anterior is just full of glands, okay? Um, is that clear or like if it's clear, I'll move on. If anyone has like any questions about ana the anatomy of this, uh, let me know. Okay. Okay. So if that's clear, I'll move on to this one. So this is kind of like a zoomed in picture of this along with the stalk. So you can see here, this is the stalk I was talking about, the connecting part. Above it is something called hypothalamus. Okay, all of the structure. Uh, ignore all of these. You you won't need to know them now. Um, and this part is the main like focus, which is pituitary. You can see there is something called anterior. Like it's divided into two, the anterior one and the posterior one. The posterior one is connected by neurons. That's why it's called neurohypothesis. And that's how you can tell that oh, since you have neurons here, this is the posterior part of the pituitary gland. Now, the important thing that you have to know are the ones that are highlighted by Dr. Ahmed. So these are the most important ones. Let's start with something we know already. So this one is, as we said, the stock, the pituitary stock or infundibulum. Okay. Um, next, we have something called adenohypophysis, which is what, what did we say about adenohypophysis? We said that it's the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, this one. So A and A together, okay? Uh, and adenohypophysis has three parts, okay? So you have, um, uh, we'll get into that later, but the posterior, so what, what about this one? The one with the neural connections from hypothalamus? This is the neurohypophysis, which is the posterior, another name for it is posterior. Um, and you can see from the graph here why it's like from the picture here why it's called that. The neurons in question, like the ones that I was just saying, um, they're they're two. Okay, they have different names. One of them is called paraventricular hypothalamic. So both of them have hypothalamic nucleus. Again, um, you can think of neurons as like cells. Okay, it's neuronal cell bodies, right? So they will have their own nucleus. So that's why in the hypothalamus, you have their nucleus or their, uh, you know, the main um, organelle. Uh, now, these are cell bodies of these two neurons. The names differ, and I want you to repeat them like over and over till you get it. Paraventricular, next to ventricles, okay? So these places around the brain, there are like spaces or ventricles. You can know that paraventricular means around ventricles, neurons around ventricles. That's the first one, the one up. Supraoptic hypothalamic nucleus is the other one. Um, how I used to memorize this is like, um, so there are different hormones in here, okay? The main function of these neurons is that they go and they stimulate release of these hormones. So from here, they stimulate, stimulate, and then they activate hormones to be released. Uh, one of them is um, ADH, which I'll get into it later. I'll mention this name again, so supraoptic. So remember that these two control the release of hormones not from hypothalamus, but they actually go down to posterior pituitary and they release hormones. Now, supraoptic, um, how I used to memorize this is because this is the supra part, it should be above, right? But because of this picture, I always used to think that supraoptic, um, it's contradictory. So supra, even though the name is supraoptic, it's the one below it, one below the paraventricular. Paraventricular is the one above, even though the name does not say, okay? So we covered this one, we covered stock, we covered posterior, there are different parts and anterior different parts. Again, it's very early for you to know in this lecture which parts are they, but you can you can just, I'll just list the names out. So pars intermedia means in the middle. So you can see that it's the one cutting the anterior from posterior, so intermedia. Distalis is the one distal, the most 
far away from the brain structure, let's say. That's why it's distalis. Tuber tuberalis is kind of like the tube, tubular part at the beginning. That's how I used to memorize. But these are parts of anterior pituitary gland. Okay. Um, okay. I'll just keep chat open here in case like anyone asks anything in between. So I hope this is clear. And I'll move on to the next one. So this is all just kind of like anatomy that I'm talking about. This is another summary of this other the slide I was saying just now. Uh, so you can see here anterior. So this is just flipped from the other um, other picture. This one is now anterior. This one is posterior. But don't get confused because, again, like I said, the way you know which one is posterior or anterior is by the way, like, which one of them is connected to the one up, like, with the stalk or the infundibulum, okay? So if this one, sorry, if this one is infundibulum, you can see that this is the stalk and it's going this way that makes this the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland the other one that's like kind of stuck on to the gland is anterior lobe because it just it's just gland the glandular structure so this one again it's flipped um or wait yeah actually yeah this is flipped from for people who didn't see the picture before this one this one this one the this in this picture these neurons were connected to posterior this way in the other one, you can see that the neurons are going where? To this part. So that makes this posterior lobe. This is posterior lobe. The other one is anterior lobe. It's stuck to the other one. Now, um, let's see. So uh, do you see the, this is histology slide. I will bring this up again later. But uh, basically the one that's full of neurons or the neural hypothesis or the posterior lobe is light in color and you can see the continuation because they're full of nerve cells or nerve structure which are very thin okay this one anterior lobe or we said adenohypophysis they're full of gland glandular structure and uh, they they are just full of like cells they're packed with cells that's why this is more darker in color and that's how you tell histology and this is how you tell from anatomy so the ones the nerves that go here are the posterior you can see the nerves i mentioned here the names are written paraventricular is the one up supra optic even though it says supra it's not the one up it's the one down so it's you can memorize them as opposites okay uh, i will go to the next one if no one has any questions this is again and um, like an imaging so this one is Kind of like the first one I showed you here, but they just like captured it in the picture. So this one, the arrows pointing are kind of like not aligning to this, but I'll try to explain them. So first of all, look for the stalk or the infundibulum or a straight line that has a gland um, attached to it. Which, which one is the straight line? This one. Okay, if you guys couldn't see, this one is a straight line. That's the stalk or the infundibulum. Okay, this connects the upper part to the lower part. The upper part is something called hypothalamus and the lower part is something called hypophysis. This is the pituitary gland or the focus of our um, topic. So pituitary gland is this one. This is the most important part. If you can identify from an image, um, most likely they can, they can ask you in the exam, for example, which one is pituitary. Like for example, if this is enlarged, what's the problem? Like which gland is the problem? Your answer is pituitary. So just know it's the circular structure connected to the stalk. Now, remember where where the um, pituitary gland uh, is sitting on? It's sitting on a depression of the sphenoid bone and something called cella tertica. So this is the sphenoid bone. Okay, below the sphenoid bone, this one is uh, an airspace. So your sinuses, like uh, spaces around your nose, this is your nose and that's your mouth. So that that's why it's called, the bone is sphenoid, but this one is called sphenoid air sinus. It's a space in your nose. Um, other This one is not as important here, but just know that this is your nose. So narrow, nasal pharynx. So um, a structure that's like, connected to your nose and to your pharynx, which is your digestive system. Um, but for now, this is the most important structure, okay? So if for some reason someone wants to like, for example, um, like reach pituitary gland, this one, they would have to go through the nose because there's a space here that won't hurt or damage any other structure. They can go through your like the nose openings because that's the only opening to your brain, let's say here. 
right? There's no way you can enter, penetrate the skull from anywhere else. So if you go from here, there's a space in the nose and pituitary gland is right next to it. So for any procedure, for anything that they that um, people might need, they can access it through the nose, okay? Pituitary gland. And I'll come, to, I'll emphasize this point later on too. Now, this is another picture again, but basically they took like the skull, for example, and they cut it like that, like a straight line like this through the head, okay? Like that. So this is why, uh, so when you cut it like that, the pituitary, we said pituitary is on the base of the skull, which means the bottom of the skull. Let's see here, here. So this is your, oh, all of your brain and skull and everything is here. And pituitary is like kind of below all of this at the base, okay? So if you cut like from the head like this, okay, like that, sorry, my, it's not clear, yeah, here like this, and you cut it like that, you will see the pituitary gland like open, okay, so it will be like a structure there, open here. So um, the labeling, the labeling will come soon, but the only structure you can see at kind of like, it's just one structure in the middle is this one. So that's your pituitary gland, okay. Pituitary gland, do you see? So hypothesis. Another name is pituitary gland. Now, okay, so if you cut it from here, you can see that it's surrounded by a lot of different structures. So the only safe entry is the nose, like we said, from the nose. But uh, um, around it, you have, uh, you don't have brain structures around it, you have above it, but around it, you have important veins, nerves, and arteries, okay? And those are always important because um, if any mistake happens, uh, you can damage those. So you have a venous system, you have arteries, you have nerves. The venous system is very thick here because all of the blood from the brain, they kind of collect there. They like they they are drained from the brain and they go to this to the base. Okay. They collect there so that they can go back to the heart. So this huge like collection of venous system is something called cavernous sinus. And it's a very like important structure because it's where all of the, again, blood drains into. So cavernous sinus is this huge bulky vein structure here and here and side of this. So if you see it, this picture, okay, this picture from this side, from if you are facing it from this side, from the back, you will see it like that. So basically you're cutting this into half, like let's say like that, okay? Uh, that's why you can see that the pituitary gland is here, right here, it sits in the space, okay? Um, sphenoid bone, remember this is the sphenoid bone and depression, that it sits in that depression or the hole. But around it, you have veins, you have arteries, you have nerves, and that's, a, that's the important thing about this. So veins, we said cavernous sinus, Okay, it's a huge collection of veins. You can, I used to memorize this as like the, from the word cave, let's say, um, and sinus. So it's a huge collection of veins. Okay. And then this one, the artery here is something called internal carotid artery. It's a very important artery and you can know by the position. So this one is inside the brain, right? It comes from the heart. So it's inside the brain. So internal carotid artery. Uh, there's external, which is, it does not enter the brain um, cavity at all. Okay, that's how the names are given. So cavernous sinus, internal carotid artery, and the nerves that are important here are called optic nerves here, okay? So optic nerves are the nerves for your eye. They come from your eyes. So this brain structure here, I said that you cut your, like if someone cuts, if a head is cut like that, then it's uh, this is how it shows. The eyes you can see are here. So your front of the head is here, back is here. So you're facing like towards that basically. So the eyes, the nerve from the eyes go back and they enter the brain because they have to go inside, right? The, your brain has to like um, press, process what you're seeing and then like uh, tell you what you're seeing. Uh, you will take this in your, but basically nerves have to enter the brain. Uh, so once they enter from this side with along with the internal carotid artery, so they're coming from both sides, right? From your left eye and from your right eye like this. So when they join together here, they form something called, up, so they become not two nerves, but they become one. And that something is called uh, optic chiasm. This one, you can see it here. Okay, so this one here is after the joining of the optic nerves here above it 
right above the pituitary gland like this. And it forms a V here and then it goes into the brain. So this joining of structure is called again optic chiasm. From the name optic nerves with the S is the two separate nerves. If it becomes one, it's optic chiasm. So if there is any problem with the pituitary gland, let's say, um, you will find um, like it, it might affect what? Optic chiasm because it's directly above it. It can affect, again, cavernous sinus internal carotid arteries, but not optic nerves as much because you can see that they're separate here. Uh, the thing they affect is the one above it, which is optic chiasm. Okay. Um, okay, let, uh, let's move on. If I'll try to explain uh, what the vision loss is with the question. So we can move on to the structure. Okay. So this is an MRI view again. So do you see the, so this is again from, it's kind of like this, like this, if you, if someone cuts like that, okay? So this one is the stalk, right? This is this is the first thing that I want you to identify or the infundibulum, so the stalk or the infundibulum. And then that's how you know that this is the pituitary gland, okay? But if you cut it like this, right? Um, the one directly above it, okay, would be, the uh, optic chiasm so it's the nerves that would be above it if you cut it like from from your side like this and like i showed you at the beginning the one above it would be hypothalamus but if you cut it like this way okay does that make sense this way the one above it here would be optic chiasm like right directly up above it. so this is what that's what i'm trying to show you this is the optic chiasma or chiasm Below it is the pituitary gland or hypophysis. And below the hypophysis, remember we said there is this is the sphenoid bone depression. Below it, you have an air space that's empty, that's not that has nothing. This is called the sphenoid. I can't see. Yeah. Um, sphenoidal air sinus. So this is the air sinus of the sphenoid bone, like we mentioned before. Now, what about arteries and veins that's involved in this? Um, so basically, you have a lot of different... So do you see the stalk here and the pituitary gland and the hypophysis? Uh, sorry, this is hypophysis. This is hypothalamus. So the vessels are named after them. This one is the hypo, hypothalamic vessels. You don't need to really know them because it's very general. The ones in red, however, I think it's better to know them. So um let's see let's start with i want to start with this one because it's easier to explain so this one here when i say plexus plexus means um more like a connection or like a lot of vessels at in one place that's called a plexus so it's a collection okay so the first collection is here in the hypothalamus okay because and that is why it's called primary plexus so the first collection is in hypothalamus which makes sense it's the first structure up right once you go down to posterior like i mean pituitary gland down okay that's and you have collection of vessels again that's your secondary plexus so a second second collection of vessels is in the pituitary so first in up here in hypothalamus second in uh, pituitary now hypophysis so these are plexus or connections so they're both arteries and veins but mainly veins, you know, you see the venous collection. Those are the most important ones. Um, another, okay, so another one that's connecting primary with secondary plexus or collection is this long, uh, long vein. Okay, it goes through the stalk or the infundibulum, like we said. This one here is something called a uh, long portal vein. So all of this, the, the ones basically in the stalk connecting up to down, are called long from the name long portal veins long veins and portal just uh, know that it's portal okay so long portal veins so we covered this part we covered this part we said primary plexus here secondary plexus here the one connecting them connecting them is long portal vein now another vein that's important is in the in the pituitary gland again pituitary gland another name for it is hypophysis so these are called hypophysial veins they come out of the pituitary and they supply the blood um, other other structures and that's where that's how hormones and are released from anterior and posterior 
the one artery that's mentioned here is the superior hypophyseal artery. And I think that's the only one you need to know. So that means, so hypophyseal, we said, is pituitary gland. So above, superior means above. So above the pituitary gland artery, okay? So that's, it's just above the, like, let's say the pituitary is here. And the arteries that go up, up, up are superior hypophyseal artery. Even though they're from, like, they're, they look like they're from hypothalamus, they're just from down. So arteries go the opposite direction of veins, right? That's why. So if, if it makes it easier to understand, um, arteries will take blood from the heart and it will supply the brain, sorry. And veins will go, that's why this is a superior hypophysis. So coming from the pituitary artery, the veins will go opposite. So they drain all of the blood goes from the brain. It goes down to the heart through veins. That's why the primary site is here, up. Secondary is down, okay? And all of these, again, these veins. And then after secondary, you have individual hypophysial veins that go to the uh, blood, that go back down to the heart. Now, um, I think that those are the main points that I wanted to say. And cavernous sinus is the main collection of veins from the other uh, brain structures. So they will be also be here, um, which is not from the picture. But again, you don't need to know the individual names. Just know these four boxes. This is another picture that it's is the same as this one. I just kept it for because it's the same from the lecture. But uh, yeah, if you understand this, that's more than enough. Shall we? Okay, so I think I have a few more anatomy slides and then we're, yeah, this is the last one. But last thing I wanna mention for anatomy, even though this is not, but you see here how anterior is stuck to the posterior. Posterior is from up, from the neurons. Um, they both, the way, like, why are they divided in this anterior posterior is because they have different functions um, and they release different hormones. As an endocrine gland, it's supposed to release hormones. They release different hormones. This one here, um, the one above it, which is called hypothalamus, also releases structures that go and influence pituitary. That's why hypothalamus is connected to pituitary because it needs to send signals and stimulate cells of pituitary. After stimulation, pituitary will release hormones. Okay, So hypothalamus' job is to stimulate Pituitary, pituitary will release them after stimulate. So stimulate means like trigger them to form hormones. Um, again, so different hormones. Let's start with hypothalamus. This will make the upcoming slides easier. So hypothalamus will release um, hormones that stimulate this. So what I like to memorize was things like, gonad so I'll explain the names later, but gonadotropin, releasing hormones. So everything, anything with the word releasing, 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 inhibiting, releasing, so these are from hypothalamus because they control pituitary gland. Uh, they basically control. The only exception is something called somatostatin. You should know that somatostatin is an inhibitory molecule. So if you have somatostatin, like if I introduce som somatostatin here, it will just stop all kinds of hormone production. That's why, because it's an inhibitory molecule by on itself, this is considered to be released from up hypothalamus, along with the rest of inhibiting and releasing hormones. Now, the second part of this is um, anterior. So you have different hormones again, anterior and posterior. Anterior has the most hormones, like we said, adenohypophysis. It's full of gland cells, like it's packed with uh, glands. So it has things like follicular follicle stimulating hormone, which means it will stimulate what follicle? It will not stimulate like this. So that's why it's not called releasing, but it will stimulate follicles. Um, follicles are like structures in the in uh, in the female in the ovaries to stimulate um, estrogen production. Okay, for uh, characteristics like and puberty, and they're responsible for those. Now luteinizing hormone. So this is FSH and LH, okay, from anterior pituitary. These are called, sometimes called gonadotropes because they go and affect gonads. So gonads meaning reproductive structures like organs. In females, ovaries. So these will go to the ovaries. In uh, males, their testes, okay, FSH and LH. What will stimulate them from hypothalamus? It's blank releasing hormone, right? What's the blank name? Gonadotropin. Oh gonadotropin, sorry, gonadotropin releasing hormone. So 
from the name, like we said, this FSH and LH are sometimes called gonadotropes, right? What will stimulate them is from up hypothalamus gonadotropin releasing hormone. So this is GNRH. And so if you see those, you will know later that this will stimulate these two to be produced. FSH will go somewhere else, LH will go somewhere else, and they will act on the body differently. Now, the third one is called thyroid stimulating hormone or thyrotropin. These are your thyroid, you know, the thyroid gland, it has a lot of hormones. Basically, their job is to keep up metabolism and uh, keep up with your energy levels. Okay, so um, and metabolize like your food, whatever you eat for energy. So thyroid stimulating hormone. Don't confuse this with the one that's from hypothalamus. So thyroid stimulating, all of this is from anterior pituitary gland. They release to your body. What stimulates them is from something higher up in the th hypo uh, hypothalamus. So FSH LH was from gonadotropin releasing hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone is from thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay. So if this is here, then this is here in anterior pituitary. And then your thyroid hormones will be high in your body and your metabolism will be high. Now, let's go to the fourth one, which is called adrenocorticotropic hormone. In other words, ACTH, that's another hormone from the name adrenocorticoadrenal glands. They will go and affect your adrenal gland. You will take a separate lecture about them and so on, but just know that they affect adrenal glands. Now, what stimulates adrenocorticotropic hormone from up? So you go back to the hypothalamus. What stimulates this release is corticotropin releasing hormone because from the name corticotropin. So if your body needs or senses that it needs more ACTH, you will know the function of it later. If it needs more ACTH, your body will start producing so many corticotropin releasing hormones in hypothalamus. It will go down the stalk to the anterior pituitary and release adrenocorticotropic hormone, which will then act on your body, uh, for uh, on your adrenal glands, basically. Okay, so we covered a lot of hormones, um, and I promise they'll make it easier for the upcoming slides, inshallah. So the fifth one is called uh, prolactin, okay? Prolactin is, it's a different hormone, but you can see the names from hypothalamus. They're prolactin releasing hormones, prolactin inhibiting hormones. So you have two. Prolactin is from the, the word here, lact, it's in, important for lactation. So uh, breast milk production and feeding the baby. Okay, so they will go and act on breast tissue and milk production, basically. So prolactin will be released from anterior pituitary gland also last thing is something called growth hormone growth hormone from the name it will affect your bones your muscles and uh it's like it triggers it, it not triggers right it uh if it's present in your body it will make your body grow in a healthy way it's normal in normal levels what will stimulate the release of growth hormone from this one is hypothalamus which one is or which hormone is growth hormone releasing hormone so all of this stimulates the different cells here, which will go in your bodies and act, basically. Now, somatostatin, we said it's an inhibitory molecule, which will inhibit every other thing it sees. So basically, somatostatin inhibits all of this. So if somatostatin is here, all of this will be low, okay? And your metabolism, your um, like reproductive system, adrenals, uh, breast tissue, like no more milk will be produced growth hormone, the person will be very, very short because there is not enough growth hormones. Okay, now this is, we covered hypothalamus and um, anterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary, however, we said there are neurons and there's only two, two neurons, paraventricular and supraoptic. These two neurons means that there's only two hormones from posterior pituitary, which are ADH and oxytocin. Um, I will come to that later on too, but just remember these names, ADH and um, oxytocin, okay, A and O, so all the vowels. Now, we'll move on to a question about anatomy before I move on to physiology of this. So um, for the people here, if you want to answer, go ahead and uh, I, like on the chat if you want to discuss. So question one. A 32-year-old man is admitted to the emergency department with visual problems. 
Um, examination reveals a tumor of adenohypophysis. In brackets, I made it easy for you. So AA, anterior pituitary gland or lobe. Uh, examination reveals a loss of the lateral halves of field of vision. So what that means is lateral halves. Wait, let me show you. So this is your visual field, right? This one, this is your left eye. This is your right eye. They said you lose lateral halves of the field. So if you divide this, this the out basically the outer part. So you the the person who presented they could not see like this way from the left and this way from the right. So they can only see straight. Okay, why is that? This is called bitemporal hemoanopia or tunnel vision. So you can see it. They can see like a tunnel basically. They cannot see the sides. Um. Which of the following structures are most likely compressed by the tumor? A, B, C, or D, or E. And related to the pituitary gland, okay? So if the pituitary gland is affected, basically that's what they're asking. Which structure will be affected? Does anyone want to answer or like, should I just show it for the, like the recording? B? Yeah, good. Uh, uh, wait, I couldn't see who said that, but yeah, good job. So the answer is B, optic chiasm, because, wait, let me go out of this, yeah. So, yeah, there you go. So this is the structure that we said, it's right above the pituitary gland, right? So if pituitary gland has a tumor, it enlarges, it will compress on that that part, optic chiasm. Optic, optic nerve, again, it's nearby it, but not like not above it. It will not compress it as much as optic chiasm. So this is the vision that I wanted to let you know. If optic chiasm is affected, right? So let's imagine that. Wait, oh, I forgot to. Yeah, here. So this is up. These are optic nerves. Okay, they have like both of this. So when they join together, they form optic chiasm. And that's why both of these fields are affected. The, these ones are not affected because they have other roots, like they can go here and they go to the other side and so on. So not all of it is affected. These kind of skip, wait, actually, wait, let me let me show you if it, in case this makes more sense. So these are the ones that cross in optic chiasm. These ones do not, they, they go like this, if I remember, like they do not pass, they do not pass it. Okay, and there's another one too here, but yeah. That you will take the eye structure later on too. But basically just know that the lateral half will go to the optic chiasm and that's why they're affected first. The ones for your like your tunnel vision is it goes to the back of your brain. It bypasses it basically. Okay. So yeah, that's it. Um I hope this is clear for everyone watching, inshallah. Now let's go to the next one. I'll go into embryology and okay. So embryology is just one slide uh, because that's all that we want you to know for pituitary. Um, so basically, so we said uh, we have anterior pituitary gland and posterior pituitary gland, right? So the anterior comes from something. That's why it looks like it's stuck, stuck on. Posterior comes from up. So you can know by now. So posterior comes uh, from the neural tissue, from the neurons, because that's where the neurons are in the posterior. So they come from the brain. What makes up the brain structure? Something called uh, an ectoderm or a neural tube. You will take this in embryology, but basically um, if you want me to like briefly explain it, this is like ectoderm, ectoderm divides into neural tube, and crest and so on. And then you have mesoderm, endoderm. This part here becomes the brain, okay? Neural tube. So from the name neural tube is a tube full of neural tissue or nerve tissue. So brain, okay? Because your brain is a collection of structures. Um, and, um, and the posterior pituitary gland is made up of that, okay? Now, so if I say posterior pituitary gland, that's from your neural neural tube, okay? Just know that. Or ectoderm, because neural tube is from ectoderm, which is the outer layer of the whole, like, the embryological process, 
Okay, does that make sense? I hope you guys took embryology like uh, before about this, but uh, that's that's what I mean. Okay, so you can see here if if I want to explain it more, this is the neural tube, the tube that I just drew. It elongates into your brain and your spinal cord. So this one, when the part where it goes into the brain, part of it drops down. Okay, and it makes a stalk. Remember the infant debula? It makes a stalk and it forms the posterior part of your pituitary gland. This one. So it goes down like this, infant debula, and then this is the posterior part, for example. This is the posterior part. Now, for anterior part, anterior, just know that because the posterior is the only one with the neural tissues, anterior is something completely different. Remember the one I showed you like this, mesoderm, endoderm. So this one from the back, this is where posterior pituitary comes. The endoderm, however, is where anterior, so posterior is the outermost neural tube layer, anterior is the innermost layer. So basically this one is called endo, um, endoderm. Um, and endoderm comes from so endoderm, basically, if you took an embryology, lines all your cavity or your GI, your oral mucosa, everything. So the mouth, the oral cavity is one of the places where this, all of this is endoderm. All of this is endoderm. Okay, You can see this is the inner layer of the um, layers, like the embryological layers. Now, this one of the part will go up instead of like down. It will invaginate up like this. And it will cause something called, it's like a pouch, right? It's like a, a small space, like a bag. So this one is called rat keys pouch, okay? Um, just know this name, but basically if this one goes, it's since it's like a pouch up there, this will join with this, uh, wait, rat keys pouch will, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I'll answer that. So rat keys pouch will come from here, from the oral and will join with the, the posterior and that's why you have two parts of um like the pituitary gland they're connected together okay isn't it made up of ectoderm yeah that's the confusion i had myself in in second year when i took this um in endorepro so basically ratki's pouch is from endoderm i searched it up just to make sure again um but if okay so do you know that it comes from the oral cavity Right. And or do you know what oral cavity is made of? Like if you took that in embryology. So it makes sense to say endoderm. Did you get it or no? If you yeah, okay. So um I know Dr. Ahmed tricked us too with the question. So he, he was like, Where does Radke's pouch come from? And I thought like we all thought it was ectoderm. But um, yeah, the answer is endoderm. It was, I think it was mentioned in the slide somewhere small, uh, but basically if it's from the oral cavity, if you mentioned that it comes from your uh, oral lining, which is endoderm, which is like, yeah. That's why they have different anyway. So if it was from ectoderm, let's say if it was, it would have neural tissue, but it does not. Like it doesn't, you know, it goes for up from here, from your mouth and then, it just sticks to the neural structure. But at the end of the day, both of this together, they join together and they form one band, just anterior and posterior part. That's why there's this uh, distinction between them. And here you can see, so this one is from endo, this one is from ectoderm, from the nerves. And this one here you see is the optic chiasma. Again, it's part of the neural structure because it's part of the brain and the nerves, but it's directly above uh, the pituitary gland, okay? It's, this is not part of the stock, by the way, but it's just shown there just to show you that it's nearby. It's directly above. If you if you have more questions, let me know. If anything's not clear, let me know. But I hope this this is all for embryology. Um, just know the origin of both anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. Again, endoderm, anterior, posterior, from which one? Ratke's pouch. That's more important, I think. And then the posterior, what's important is ectoderm or neural tube, if you want to call it. So there's another picture he added, this one. Um, this one basically shows the same thing. So, mm, yeah, I, I don't know why it says ectoderm, honestly, but when I searched it, maybe this was the confusion because this is a different, um, like a book or resource, I'm not sure. 
But BRS, like the other books, they say that Ratke's part is from endoderm. Let me share again. But yeah. Endoderm. Um, I will search on this again, but it's, I don't know, it, it was endoderm when I saw it in my, like, in exams, like in, I don't know if you know about step, like step exam, they say, oh, they always say endoderm, that's the thing. So, yeah, so if it comes from oral pouch, just know that it's endoderm, I'll, I think I'll remove this and send it, but yeah, so from the oral endoderm, and then this one is from ectoderm, uh, neuroectoderm. I think they mean here, when they say oropharynx ectoderm, they mean the endoderm because it's from the mouth, right? So it's that layer in the mouth. That's what I, that's like to my understanding, that's what I know. So this one goes up, this one from the neuroectoderm. So neuro, if they specified neuroectoderm, that's the actual ectoderm, okay? That, that's what I understood from this one. Um, I don't know which book is this from though, so uh and then they join together and they form one big gland okay now if you have is that clear or like did i confuse you does this make sense i hope i hope so okay yeah yeah that to my understanding it's like that so yeah i hope it's clear now, okay, let's move on to physiology. We have this and histology left. Um, so let's see. So for physiology, we said that there's hormones from secreted from hypothalamus that regulate secretion of hormones from anterior pituitary. We mentioned all of this in the previous slide, but anterior pituitary has a lot of hormones, okay? So, um, some of them are listed here, which I'll go over them. So. PRL is prolactin, like we said, prolactin from the word lact is responsible for lactation, which in English it means um, like uh, feeding, uh, like breastfeeding. Um, and that's why it affects, it goes, prolactin goes from anterior pituitary gland and acts on mammary gland or the glands in the breast tissue to produce milk for the, for babies, okay? Now, this is increased in people, uh, in, I mean, in women who give birth and they're like, uh, like they actually need to produce milk and so on. And that's why uh, it's important for them. And that's its function, okay? The other one here in this box is growth hormone. Like we said, from the name growth, it stimulates growth of children, growth of adults, everything, muscle and bone growth. You can see here fat, muscle and bone. So, a growth hormone is, the, I think, the only one that secretes another hormone downstream. So, grow, so there's hypothalamus, and then growth hormone from anterior pituitary, um, stimulated by, do you see here, TR releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, corticotropic releasing hormone, all these different things. But growth hormone is stimulated by um, growth hormone releasing hormone. That's it, as simple as that. So this one will go to the liver and will it will actually produce another hormone. So growth hormone's main action or target is the liver. The liver will produce something called insulin growth factor, which can then go to all these areas of the body. So growth hormone, growth factor, and then to all the areas. Um, this is because insulin growth factor has can have an effect on more than one place. That's why it's it's like there, so it will be elevated in people who have high growth hormone, and it will affect all of these places. Now let's go here. We have TSH. What did we say about TSH? Thyroid stimulating hormone, stimulated by in the hypothalamus, thyroid troppin releasing hormone TRH TSH. It will go to thyroid and release thyroid hormones. So each of these have different places of action. The next one, LH, FSH, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating follicle hormone are stimulated by gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This one, GNRH. Growth hormone is why? Growth hormone-releasing hormone, so GHRH. So don't confuse them. I, I, um, I kind of confused them before, but this will help you remember that gonadotropes or gonads are stimulated by gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Now, anterior pituitary will release LH and FSH and stimulate gonads, like we said. In males, it's the testis is the reproductive organ. 
in females ovaries are the reproductive organ just know that and i'll i'll talk more about it about the specific functions later the last hormone from the anterior pituitary is something called ACTH. We said adrenocorticotropic hormone acts on adrenal gland. So that's its target, okay? What is ACTH stimulated by? Like its release is stimulated by something in the hypothalamus called corticotropic releasing hormone. So CRH. So CRH is for ACTH. GNRH stimulates LH and FSH. TRH, thyroid, is TSH. So R H, uh, I mean R S, and then here R S like that. So this one even, okay. Uh, prolactin is not stimulated; is slightly stimulated by this one, thyroid one, uh, which I'll come to that. But it's mainly inhibited by something called dopamine. Dopamine is a hormone in our brains. It's like released. It's released when we're like when someone is happy and like they have a lot of dopamine. Uh, like in their bodies and in their brains dopamine actually inhibits prolactin so if someone has too high dopamine then uh, prolactin will be less and its function is less um, if someone for example cuts this stalk cuts the infundibulum okay not all of this will be less because they need the releasing hormones from hypothalamus so if you cut this okay this will be less this will be less this will be less this will be less except prolactin because now you don't have the dopamine's inhibitory power on prolactin you cut that off so prolactin is now not inhibited by anything so it will continue to uh, be stimulated so that's uh, yeah, we will come to like if this is if this gets cut by any any by any chance okay that's this what you should know about this um okay i will go yeah so these are the hormones secreted i tried to summarize them in the previous slide but basically fsh follicle stimulating hormone again it's a repeat of the previous one lh luteinizing hormone the above two are called gonadotropins or gonadotropes those are the cells TSH, thyroid stimulating hormones or thyrotrophs. ACTH is this. Growth hormone is for growth. Um, okay, somatotropin. Yeah, so one, uh, and then prolactin. PRL is prolactin. One other thing for this one. The growth hormone goes to liver, insulin growth factor. This growth factor is sometimes called somatomedins, um, as in like it mediates the growth. Don't confuse that with somatostatin, which is the inhibitory, the big, big inhibitory molecule from the hypothalamus, and it comes and decreases everything. It decreases even prolactin, this, 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 this. So that's called somatostatin, this one, okay? And the I the growth factor is called somatomedins, mediation, mediates, something like that. So um, the two... The big, big inhibitory molecule is somatostatin. The slightly inhibitory is dopamine. It only inhibits prolactin. It's like only selective for prolactin, not everything else. That's why. Okay. So this is a table from, um, again, it kind of summarizes everything. I just put it here because of the lecture. But the only difference that you should know probably between them, growth hormone and prolactin are like the most common cells, I would say, in the in the packed cells of that adenohypophysis. And they are mainly proteins. Like their growth hormone, it acts on proteins, right? Muscle, bone. So it's mainly a protein. Prolactin also, it produces milk. So it's mainly protein. Um, you can think like that. Uh, and they're the most common anyway. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic, is a small polypeptide. Um, again, polypeptide is a smaller structure than protein, so it's just shorter. That's all you need to know. Uh, FSH, LH, and TSH, however, so the things that are like um, FSH, TH, TSH, and LH is always linked with FSH. These ones are always, always glycoproteins, which means that carbohydrate is attached to them, okay? Um, just know that. So these are the main functions that I wanted you to, like, uh, like read over, but again, just remember the ones I said, and they should be enough for the exam. So, for example, growth hormone, it acts on uh, liver to release insulin growth factor IGF, which in turn stimulates body growth. That's all you need to know. Prolactin, the main um job of this is initiates milk formation. That's it. 
this one again we never really took it uh, in detail so no need but basically this all of this production is goes into milk breast milk that that's all you need to know ACTH um, again adrenal glands have a lot of different like structures you have something called um, zone of again there are many zones in adrenal adrenal gland like this one you see here like this 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 you will have a separate lecture on this but um, cortisol production aldosterone so different hormones can be produced from adrenal glands here like secretion of glucocorticoids cortisol uh, cortisol is a stress hormone kind of thing so whenever you're stressed your adrenals will secrete that and your ACTH will be high okay mainly the target organ is adrenal gland and other hormones will come from it Follicles, follicle stimulating hormone FSH will stimulate from the name follicular development in ovary and spermatogenesis in testis. So in ovary, it will just uh, stimulate follicles from the name. In testis, it will um, initiate or it will like trigger spermatogenesis, which means making of sperm or like the cells in the gonads. So testis main job is to make sperms, right? So that's the main job of FSH itself. Now, luteinizing hormone is a, is a slightly different. Um, LH will also act on gonads, but um, it will it will kind of have a different job in the reproduction. You will take this more in your reproductive lectures, which is after the end of part. Uh, but just know that they act on testes and ovaries. Um, and I think that should be it. Uh, so things related to reproduction other than spermatogenesis and follicular development all falls under LH. That's an easier way to memorize it. So things like ovulation, this, this, this. Um, androgen is means testosterone, so the other hormone. Everything else falls under LADIC. Uh, like, sorry, LH, LH. I just saw LADIC here, that's why. So LH is everything else. FSH, follicle stimulating. It's a simple name from the word follicle, so it's a very simple function. That's all you need. Okay, now thyrotropic hormone, again, Thyroid gland is responsible for, see, simulates growth of thyroid cells, and that's it, thyroid hormones. That's uh, the simple function of thyrotropic hormone. Now, let's go to the next one. This is, again, the same exact thing um, you will see here. We, yeah, so grow, this is, it's the same thing, but it's the hormones from hypothalamus, so from up controlling the ones down. We said growth hormone, releasing hormone from the name, it will stimulate the release of growth hormone. So here, this one's this one, by the way, the source, it just means where all of this is in the same place, anterior pituitary gland. So this will stimulate its target, the target of hypothalamic hormones, hypothalamus hormones is the one below it, the pituitary gland. That's it. And this one basically is for anterior part of pituitary gland. The neurons are responsible for posterior. Now, growth hormone releasing hormone, from the name, it stimulates growth hormone. Somatostatin is the big inhibitory molecule. It will inhibit secretion of growth hormone um, and other cells, uh, which are not, which is not mentioned here, but it will actually inhibit everything else, but mainly growth hormone. Dopamine, like we said, if... Um, if someone has very high dopamine in their bodies, if they take dopamine drugs, let's say, uh, it will inhibit. It's also an inhibitory molecule along with somatostatin. It will inhibit prolactin. Now, cortico -release, cort corticotropin releasing hormone. Again, releasing hormone. So from hypothalamus, what will it inhib? Uh, what will it stimulate? The release of corticotropic, I'm repeating myself here, but um, as long as you guys get it. So secretion of ACTH from anterior pituitary. Gonadotropin releasing hormone for gonadotropes, FSH, LH from anterior pituitary. Thyrotropin releasing hormone, thyroid hormones, or no, sorry, actually, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone from anterior pituitary, which will go to the thyroid and make thyroid hormone. So this comes first, and then the hypothalamus will uh, stimulate each of this hormones from anterior lobe of pituitary gland. Okay, so I hope that was clear. This is question number two, and I think oh no, okay, I'm sorry, I was going to the next slide. So the pituitary gland produces numerous hormones. Which of the following is not a hormone of the of the pituitary gland from the ones we talked about? 
if, if you, even if you saw it, you can just say and like you can say, tell me why. If you don't want, it's fine. I'll I'll answer it for the sake of the recording. But and since the answer was shown, um, the answer is the estrogen. So, um, all of these, if you see from the name, growth hormone, is a is a hormone released from anterior pituitary gland, like we just said. Thyroid stimulating hormone from anterior pituitary gland. Prolactin from anterior pituitary gland. ACTH, anterior pituitary gland. Estrogen is here to confuse you because estrogen is actually produced by ovaries. So it's not a hormone from the pituitary gland. Okay, pituitary gland will only release FSH and LH, which will go to ovaries. The ovaries will release estrogen. So that's the answer. And I have the explanation in the notes below too, if that helps. Now we'll move on to tumors, the topic of tumors. And um, I, I think after this we'll be done, inshallah. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, okay, after this, I can. I think I'll give a break for a prayer and then we can continue to histology, which is the last part. So tumors are abnormal growth of cells. Okay, so if there's a tumor of the pituitary gland, so all these cells that are packed in the anterior pituitary, some of these cells are for growth hormone. They only release growth hormone. Some of these cells are, they release prolactin. Some of these cells are only releasing ACTH, G, um, gonadotropes, and things like that. So tumor is an abnormal growth of one of these cells or all of these cells, which is a tumor of the pituitary gland in general. So tumor, if you have a tumor in one of these cells, you will have excess function of that hormone because you're producing too much out of your control. So an example, so here they're just mentioning what tumors are. Um, tumors are common cause. Again, if if it gets too big and it compresses optic chiasm and neural structures around it, it will cause visual disturbances. And again, this is this is like it should be more clear. I would prefer if they wrote here optic chiasm because that's the main thing that's affected by pituitary gland. And optic nerve is around it. Um, the pituitary hormones may secrete, yeah, okay. So in tumors, you have too much. So it would be hyper secretion of the hormones. Now, if you have tumor, um, there would be a growth of the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland would be larger Okay, and it would, uh, like like we said, it will compress the nearby structures. So in imaging, you will, p p patients can be diagnosed actually with the, like with the enlargement. So in the first, first x-ray, we saw that the pituitary gland was like this small structure connected by a stalk. Like it was very hard to find it even. With this one, do you see the big round structure? And this is the small stalk connected to it. This is the pituitary adenoma, or in other words, tumor. Adenoma from the name adeno uh, here is um, uh, gland is adeno like whatever. So it's a tumor of the gland. Which gland? Pituitary. Oma is tumor. So gland tumor, pituitary gland tumor. Okay. Now you see this enlargement. You can uh, tell that this is a tumor and then there's an enlargement on this side and you can tell that there is a tumor. Craniopharyngioma again um cranio is brain pharynx pharynx is from your like from the nasal pharynx that part from your next to your nose inside geoma is oma is again tumor so it's a tumor of a structure that's made from the oral cavity or the mouth or the nose or the endoderm right so that's craniopharyngioma it's the literal definition like i just broke it down for you is tumor of the rat keys pouch or um anterior pituitary gland it's it's a very common tumor in children again um but yeah it's uh, like you will see them both as masses whether it's craniopharyngioma or any other cells in the pituitary that have the tumor okay now again if you have a tumor here, if you have a large enlargement of a structure here, how do you remove it? How do surgeons want to remove this tumor? Because it's compressing their eyes and they cannot see, right? If it compresses optic chiasma um, and it will 
like it will cause headaches and things like that. So they want to remove it. So how would they remove it? The only safe space, like I kept saying, is that nasal pharynx or from the nose. So the nose, the openings are the only safe space of entry. So they can go through the nose to the uh, sphenoid air sinus and kind of cut out the tumor, okay? Or resect like most of it so that at least it's not compressing. It's not a big mass in the brain compressing the structures. So that process from the nose and cutting that pituitary gland is called transphenoidal microsurgery. Again, trans, it's like across sphenoidal through the sphenoid air sinus microsurgery. Um, okay, through the mouth and the nose, yeah, here, along the floor of the nose and through the mouth, both are fine. Um, again, it, this means that the neural, like the pituitary gland is cut uh, with the abnormal tumor cells. And yeah, this is, I think that's all you need. This is extra details for the surgery. But here, from the nose, you they would go in and they can access this one safely through the space, through the sphenoidal air sinus. So this is the transphenoidal surgical approach. And this is in tumors again. Now, on the topic of tumors, I, I again rearranged his slides. Um, so they're all um, like under each other. So I wanted to separate this topic only by growth hormone. Growth hormone, we said growth hormone and prolactin are the two main important hormones from where? From anterior pituitary gland. Now growth hormones, if there is a tumor of the cells producing growth hormone, then if you have too much growth hormones, you can imagine what the effects will be, right, on the child. So they will grow rapid, like they will have a very tall height. So let's say, for example, here, it's a long paragraph that was in the slide, but um, I'll try to make it easier. So growth hormone tumor or excess or a lot of growth hormone production causes something called acromegaly. Acromegaly is a term used in, oh, I'll, I'll come to this now, I'll come to this. But basically, if you have lots of growth hormone, um, you will either grow tall um, or you will form something called acromegaly. Uh, wait, I'll actually show you here. This person, for example, she was growing like normally, but then at an older age, there was a tumor of the growth hormone, right? So once adults, um, above 18, above 20, when they stop growing, right? Uh, that's because their epiphyseal plates, of, so the bone keeps growing, growing, growing like that of the legs, let's say. Imagine this is the leg that keeps growing, right? A point comes when they stop growing. That means that's when the epiphys there is something called epiphyseal line or a line between the bones. They kind of like fuse they fuse and it stops like it doesn't grow any taller the person will not grow any taller like me for example my like it's i won't like, my height won't change right because that's how in adults they are like that so once these lines fuse the bones will not grow to get like grow anymore right um so this person developed a tumor after the closing after the fusion of this so if you have too much growth hormone you can't, they, she can't grow taller than she already is because the bones are fused. So what will growth hormone affect? They will affect things like um, hands here. So they can grow like thicker and like, um, like an abnormal shape. They can also affect face because they're soft tissue. So here, do you see like her face shape, her nose became larger, her chin became larger like that. Here, as she got older, like the hands became rough and like very thick. Right, so growth hormone will not affect their height in adults. It will cause this enlargement, gross enlargement of hands and face, and toes. For example, they will say that their hat size changed, their ring size, like their ring won't fit anymore, or their shoes uh, won't fit anymore. If you see that in an exam, that's acromegaly. So this abnormal growth of hands, face, um, like you can things you can see, that's called acromegaly. That happens in adults, AA again, acromegaly in adults. In children, the bones are like this. They're growing, they're growing, they're growing. It's still not fused, right? So they can still grow. So if you have excess amount of growth hormone, they will grow like a lot, lot more than other children. So they will grow like that because it's it's too fast for the, the fusion to happen. So they will keep, con like, uh, keep continuing to grow, but it's not a good growth because they will 
uh, we do you see, for example, this one. Um, uh, he had an excess of like growth hormone as a child, so that's why the the fusion of the bone happened way later, and he like it's gigantism, so like a giant, uh, it he became very tall. So people with this uh, growth hormone excess in children will have something called gigantism here. So in adults, acromegaly, which is face, hands, you will see like uh, it become thick and wide. In children, you will have gigantism. Why? Because um, this one, the plate fusion of the bones does not happen in children yet, but it happens in adults. So they don't, they can't grow to be giants, right? It's only, it only happens in the children. Now, again, yeah, so this is um, after puberty, they can no longer grow and so on. So it will increase hand and foot size. This is talking about acromegaly, enlargement of even the tongue and coarse facial features, like thick facial features, and also insulin resistance. So because they grow thicker and larger and they gain weight and so on, they will have something called insulin resistance. So insulin is not working, glucose intolerance, like they cannot take um, absorb enough glucose, let's say. Okay, because it, all of the structures are being affected, like they're growing more and more and more, and it's they they're not having an effect. Um, again, if this is this can be this can happen in growth hormone tumors if you have excess in children and adults. Okay, so two different manifestations. Um, the treatment for this is you give somatostatin. Remember, somatostatin is a big inhibitory molecule. If you give that, the tumor or the growth hormone will be less and less and less. That's why. Okay. Um, let's move on to growth hormone deficiency. The opposite will happen if you have no growth hormone. This is not tumorous. This can happen in, it can happen, but very rare. It can just be like the cells are dying or something like two, you have stroke, um, uh, the brain tissue is dying. That's when the cells stop working. Growth hormone might be deficient. So if growth hormone is less, they would just cause dwarfism. So if you know like dwarfs, it's just failure to grow or they will just stay short. This can this is the same in adults and children. Like um, for example, they will not grow thinner. Like in adults, it's it's just dwarfism. Like they will have failure to grow. Um, short, uh, mild, a uh, few like they can be mild, uh, mildly obese and delayed puberty. This is mainly talking about in children. Um, Again, yeah, a decrease. So if hypothalamus is less, growth hormone, releasing hormone is less, then that would mean that uh, less stimulation and less release, okay? Um, now growth hormone is, okay. So if something is deficient, uh, the treatment for that is you give excess, um, you give hormone to the patient, right? So if you give them, if they take it as drugs, like growth hormone, if they take it as injections or anything, they can still grow. Okay, so that's uh that's another like I guess problem like growth hormone being too much or too little. Okay, now you can even give them insulin growth factors because that will uh, also um, stimulate the growth. Wait, I'm I'm just charging my laptop and I'll come like I'll just talk about. Okay, so for the next one. The next tumor or excess hormone that I'm talking about will be prolactin. We said growth hormone and prolactin are the most common two. Prolactin is the ne wait, just a second. Yeah, yes. Okay. Prolactin is the next one here. If prolactin is too high, then there will be milk discharge from the breast tissue, even though the woman might not be pregnant or anything, that it will be kind of suspicious for them, right? So if they suddenly have milk secretion, they will um, they will be checked and so on. One of the causes of this is prolactin excess. So you have too much prolactin, too much uh, milk production. Um, again, stimulates milk production and so on. So for regulation okay so this is a slide from uh the, from the book the step the first aid book but you don't need to know every word from this just know the main idea uh prolactin is like they're talking about what hormone it is and the regulation just remember what i said or this figure you'll be fine dopamine is the inhibitory molecule of prolactin 
you see it goes to anterior pituitary and prolactin. TRH stimulates slightly, even though it stimulates thyroid hormones, it can also stimulate prolactin. Um, and here, yeah. Okay, so now if the important part of this is that if dopamine becomes more with, uh, wait, actually I'll, okay, I'll ask you a question um, for, for, the record, for the sake of recording. So if dopamine drugs or agonists, so things that act like dopamine are given, what will happen to prolactin? So yeah, so if dopamine drugs are more given, prolactin will be more inhibited, right? So less and less prolactin. So you will have um, prolactin deficient sim symptoms. Like for example, if a woman wants to breastfeed, um, like in that stage of her life, uh, there, will no, there will be no milk production. And if dopamine inhibitory drugs are given, so this one, dopamine antagonists are given, which means inhibit dopamine itself, then prolactin will increase and increase and increase. So it will stimulate prolactin secretion. So prolactin can be affected by prolactin tumors, which will cause excess, or by drugs that change dopamine levels. Okay, or TRH too, but there are no drugs that like stimulate, that are given as TRH. Dopamine is because it's, um, it's a hormone, it's, it has a lot of like clinical implications, like um, in psychiatry, which we will take later. So that's why there are a lot of drugs for dopamine. So if that's affected, then prolactin can be affected too. That's the main idea. Uh, and I, I mentioned the symptoms of excess prolactin. So you guys yeah, just keep that in mind. So I want to move on with histology, but um, should I stop for five minutes for like, prayer or is it okay to continue? Wait, let me see how much is left. Uh, okay, I'll continue. Okay, I, I think we'll finish on time. So histology of pituitary gland is very, very easy. If you know the structure, if you know the anatomy, if you know physiology, you'll be fine. There are only, there's only one concept that that's probably new, but maybe, okay. so. In histology, if you section a pituitary gland and you put it on a slide, um, I think these are from animal cells, but they're basically the same. You can see here, okay, find the stock. That's my like rule for everything. Find the infundibulum or the stock connecting. This is the stock like that, right? It's connecting. So that means, uh, not from here, by the way, sorry. It's just, it's, this slide is just bent, but basically this is a line, right? This one. So this one, it comes from both here and here. That's fine. So that's the stalk or the infundibulum. Um, and then where is it? Pituitary stalk. So the one that goes into this side, the lighter side is full of neural tissue. So posterior, the one that's stuck and darker and it's like, it, it doesn't have neural tissue is anterior, pituitary gland. That's it. This is your gland. This is the stalk. This is hypothalamus. The round, round structure, I, I think this all of this is hypothalamus, by the way, but this one again is the round, if you see a round structure above pituitary, that's optic chiasma, just know that, from the O and the round structure, okay, because it's a very thick structure, hypothalamus is just like above, like it's just the structure above pituitary, it's not the nerves or anything. V is ventricle, again, third ventricle means um. There's fourth, there's third, there's uh, lateral ventricles in the brain. Uh, you don't need to know the details of all of that, but just know that ventricles are spaces in the brain. And the third ventricle happens to be one of them just above hypothalamus. So the fourth one is down here. Uh, you, will, you will understand all of them later. But yeah, so this is hypothalamus, pituitary, that's the most important part for histology. Again, this is another structure. So which one is the lighter part? This one. The lighter part, even though you don't see the stalk, this is a very close-up image. The lighter one is this. The lighter one is full of neural cells, thin axons and everything. So that's um, the posterior pituitary gland. Again, they have a different name. I put it here. It's called pars nervosa or neurohypophysis nervosa from nerves. Okay, so that's why. Uh, other than that, the gland, the packed cells are uh, full of colors and everything. This is anterior, and this is pars distalis, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the one I showed you before, distalis, pars intermedius, pi, separating these two, 
and PT parts tuberalis. Okay, these are all parts of anterior pituitary gland, but in histology. Um, I think this is a capillary, you don't need to know, just know, just know in your level how to differentiate between anterior and posterior, that's all, okay? Now, we'll go to the next uh, slide for histology, which is this one. Uh, this is a close-up of the packed cells here, adenohypophysis, and they have three different, like three um, colorful cells. One is red, one is blue, and one is colorless so the three main colors in histology are are those three anyway so okay let's see the red ones are called the the ones that stain red the ones here 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 are called uh, acidophils so they're um again the red ones are always always acidophils they like acid and they will stain eosinophil uh, eosin 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 now the blue ones again are base so B again, B and B. Basophils are stained blue. Chromophobes, C, and the word colorless, C, without color at all is chromophobes. So the pale ones, the white spaces you see here are called are colorless. They just don't take up any stain. This is the nature of each cell. Again, anterior pituitary hormones are released by cells that produce growth hormone, other cells that produce prolactin, other cells that produce FSH, other cells LH, and so on. Each one of these cells have different characteristics. Some of them are acidophils, stain red. Some of them are basophils, blue. Some are colorless or pale. They don't take up any color. Do you see here the red one? This is acidophil. This one, the pale one is C, colorless, and B is basophil. Okay, uh, blue. So the ones that are like very dark and blue, that, those are basophil. The ones that are obviously like here, for example, these are blue. The red ones, you can see the contrast between them, right? This is just a lighter color, but that's acidophils. Now, um, remember growth hormone and prolactin are the only two hormones we talked about in this lecture as tumor excess or deficiency or um, affected by drugs. But, and these two are the only ones that are acidophil. So somatotropes are cells that release growth hormone. Lactotropes are cells that release prolactin from anterior pituitary. These two are acidophils. Um, and again, they're the most common, so they always come together. I like to think of them as that. So they're acidophils. Um, they only stain acid, the red ones. So if in a slide you see acidophils, they're either growth hormone cells, which is somatotrophs, or prolactin-releasing cells, which is prolactin, I mean cells, lactotrophs. The rest that's blue will be corticotrophs for ACTH, gonadotroph for FSH, LH, and thyrotrophs thyroid stimulating hormone. So these are basophils, whatever blue you see. The colorless ones are um, other cells that are non, we have some cells that are non-functional. They don't release any hormone. They're just cells of like supporting cells and so on. So the color, colorless cells or chromophobes do not have a specific function like these, right? So they won't stain a lot. Uh, again, so we'll talk, this is the last thing. Um, posterior pituitary gland is pale, right? We said only two hormones come out of posterior. We everything else we talked about before is from anterior, um, and they, these are stimulated by the nerve cells from up in the hypothalamus. So these two are remember the names A and O, ADH and oxytocin. ADH is called antidiuretic hormone. Diuresis in uh, biology, like biology, it means um, secretion of urine, diuretic, okay? So if you have diuresis, it means secretion of water and so on. Anti or anti-diuretic means you're inhibiting that. So uh, that's, the, that's the main function of ADH. So uh, basically, if, you, if someone is thirsty or someone is dehydrated, they want to absorb water. They, want, they don't want to lose water. So the body will try to reabsorb the water in uh, that's it's a defense mechanism so like it will reabsorb the water through adh so the brain will start the posterior lobe will produce adh which will affect i don't know why it's not written here but um it will target the uh medi co collecting ducts uh, of the kidney to reabsorb water 
That's that's the main function in one sentence. So here, increase water retention, reduce urine because they don't want to lose urine in uh, dehydrated conditions. And it also functions as a neurotransmitter. That makes sense because ADH is like it's part of posterior. So it comes from posterior part of where the neurons are. Now, ADH, uh, wait, I'll, I'll come to this later. So oxytocin um, is so I remember how prolactin was for milk secretion, right? Oxytocin is lactation, but not milk production, milk ejection. So if you don't have, if you have prolactin and if you don't have oxytocin, right? If you don't have oxytocin, the milk will be produced by the prolactin, but it will not be released to the baby. It will just not like when the baby sucks on it, it will not uh, release it. That's all. Um, so oxytocin main thing is it contracts the duct to release the milk and it contracts another thing, uh, labor contraction. So it contracts the uterus in, in times of childbirth uh, to push the baby out. That's the job of oxytocin. And oxytocin comes from posterior lobe. So it's these are, again, um, possible roles. They're being studied, but the main, main functions are labor, con labor contractions and milk contraction or ejection. So for the milk to go out. Now, ADH and oxytocin um, are from, again, posterior lobe, like we said, but it's there's uh, something different about posterior lobe. So let's say that... I'll, I'll just talk on this one. So let's say this is the posterior. It comes from neurons. ADH and oxytocin are actually made um, up by the neurons here in the cell bodies. Remember, nucleus is responsible for everything. So they make the oxytocin and ADH. And then it they, they are transported from the hypothalamus, the neurons in the hypothalamus, to the stalk to posterior pituitary, and then they're stored there. So they're not made in posterior pituitary, they're made up in hypothalamus, and then they go down and they get stored here. If the if the if if it's a woman and uh, she is going undergoing childbirth, oxytocin, it will sense that it needs oxytocin. Oxytocin is already stored here, so it will be released. If a person is dehydrated, ADH is already stored here, and that's why it can be released, and it can fix the, the thirst of the person very quickly. Now, okay, so that's all. So uh, anterior uh, pituitary, the the hormones are made there and they're released there. Posterior is different because it's connected to hypothalamus, so they're made in the hypothalamus, but they're released from still released from posterior pituitary gland. So ADH and oxytocin. These are again uh, a table. Um, if you remember what I said about each of them, that should be enough. Oxytocin uh, contracts ducts of mammary glands in the breast to eject milk and in uterus for childbirth. ADH will decrease urine and by, again, collecting ducts of the kidney. Um, and it will increase blood pressure because it will uh, absorb water, right? So it will absorb all the fluids back into your body. Um, basically, a water is retention. Water absorption is the main job of ADH from the name antidiuretic. Okay, now uh, neurohypothesis is the posterior lobe. This is just a little bit more in detail. This is the pale part, right? You don't see colors. You don't see red, blue, pale. So that's not anterior. This is posterior. It's just full of neural tissue here. This one, the pale part is zoomed in. So the neuro neurohypothesis it has only neural tissue, things like uh, neurons and nerve cells and so on. Um, ADH and oxytocin are, again, like I said, they're made in the hypothalamus up and then they're transported to the pars nervosa is the posterior lobe where they're stored, where they're stored until they are needed. So this here is, they're called, um, so the place where they're stored in the posterior pituitary gland, so they're made up, they go down and they're stored. This place or this neuron neuronal bodies are called herring bodies. They're like, I just remember, I don't know, they sound like hair, right? The hair, your hair. So herring bodies will store, they kind of look big, they can store a lot of hormones. Um, so they are, they are the storage of hormones in posterior pituitary gland. So here they're filled with neurosecretory granules, in other words, hormones, the neuro hormones. Again, these are pale structures. These big, big structures in black here are called her herring bodies. And HP is done. Okay.
this one again this is a cor um, clinical correlation if you have too much of something if you have too much of adh then that means that you're absorbing too much um wait where is it uh, too much like too much um, water right that's called in this i'm um, on this side uh, inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion siadh um it means that you have too much adh so that means you have more water being reabsorbed so the salt concentration in your blood will be less your high like it will be high blood pressure um uh, yeah so that's this what so the you the so the salt in the urine will be more the salt in your blood will be diluted because you have too much water in your body. And that will cause a lot of problems in um, things with electrolyte and nerve cells. Like they won't be able to work properly. If you have too much water, right, it won't be uh, good. So, but if you have less of it, if you have deficiency of ADH, that's called, that means you're losing too much blood, right? Because you can't absorb, you're losing blood, uh, not blood, uh, you're losing a lot of urine. So you're being more and more and more dehydrated. Right, you have to drink more and more water, and you're uh, the person will be urinating more. Like uh, they will start going to the bathroom frequently. This is a sign of diabetes. Uh, spe the specific type is called diabetes insipidus. Right, the one that where ADH is less. So um, it can happen in trauma, head injuries, like things that destroy the, um, let's say stalk, let's say the posterior part. This is called hypothalamic diabetes insipidus, and it's a problem in your um, ADH secretion, either in the secretion from the brain due to trauma or um, due to channels not working in kidney. So if that's not working, that's called nephrogenic kidney diabetes insipidus. They will continue to release water more and more and more, and um, it will show a picture of diabetes. So um like urination will be more frequent uh, thirst you'll be more hungry you lose weight and so on yeah i think these are the clinical questions i have last two last questions but i'll keep this for the recording so which of the following is an accumulation and releasing center of neuro neurohormone unless unless you want to answer <laughs> If, if not, like we'll just go ahead. So um, accumulation, where does it accumulate the neurohormone? Yeah, <laughs> so the answer is C. Uh, whenever there's the word for neurohormone, like the, the hormones that are stimulated by neurons, that's always, always just go to posterior because that's what's connected to the hypothalamus with the neurons. Okay, the last one, gigantism and acromegaly are due to So these are like kind of clinical correlation. Yeah, you're right, it's B. So uh, thank you for answering by the way, but uh, hyperpituitarism. So um, if you have too much, exactly, yeah. If you have too much pituit like um, growth hormone um, secretion, right because uh, because of tumor because of anything that can happen like uh, abnormality in pituitary gland uh, that's called hyper pituitarism so pituitary is acting more than normal it's secreting more than normal which hormone specifically growth hormone gigantism in children and acromegaly in adults okay and like excess growth um yeah that's it for my part um uh, if you if anyone has any other questions uh like you, you're like feel free to email me and yeah this is the qr code that i put for feedback but yeah that's it thank you